Over the past 33 main episodes, 10 game breaks, and a handful of videos I laughingly refer to as content, I've come to realize that I talk about Nintendo way too much. Let's change that. It's nothing but Sega over the next two episodes, from their humble beginnings to their 16-bit rise and their eventual downfall. That's starting now on today's third season premiere of Sports Night. It's funny to think, but even after everything the company's been through and the position they're in now, the Sega name still commands a healthy amount of respect. Finding new ways to engage players was their business and they took fun seriously. Sure, not everything they did worked, but a lot of their output is ingrained in gaming history. The sights, the sounds, the gameplay, even that goofy ass cowboy. And without Sega, there'd be a dull, empty void where a ninja jumping into our face used to be. Sega started life as a company called Standard Games back in 1940. Founded by American businessman Marty Bromley, his father Irvin Bromberg, and family friends Glenn Henson and James Humpert, Standard Games provided entertainment to military bases in Hawaii by way of coin-operated mechanical devices, mostly in the form of one-armed bandits. By 1945, Standard Games was sold off. The team, minus Glenn Henson, continued their business under a new name, Service Games as in games for those in the service. The company faced a setback by way of the Transportation of Gambling Devices Act of 1951. Delivery of slot machines to the 50 states was severely limited, while banned outright on military bases. Service games had no choice but to head overseas, specifically the US military bases in Japan, the Philippines, and Korea. Meanwhile, Rosen Enterprises, a company founded by Brooklyn native and Korean war vet David Rosen, was finding success with various coin-operated photo booths in Japan. These booths provided an important service to a country still recovering from the war's devastation. Citizens were required to obtain photo ID cards for most everything. Rosen's devices, which were imported from the States, provided these photos in seconds rather than days. By 1956, Japan's economy was showing signs of improvement. Disposable income and free time were at an all-time high. Rosen began importing older, inexpensive games from American distributors. The electromechanical machines were a hit. Before long, the country found itself fully embracing coin-operated amusement. With increased competition, service games and Rosen merged their respective companies to stay afloat. The joint venture would become known as Sega Enterprises Limited. David Rosen would assume role as CEO, a position he held until 1996. Sega's first big hit was 1966's Periscope. Designed by Rosen himself, the game was an absolute beast compared to other machines of the time. Costing almost twice as much as the other machines around this time, it was nonetheless a hit with operators and players. In 1968, Periscope was released to the international market, including the US. To offset the initial expense, Sega advised the operators to set the price at 25 cents per game, a pricing standard that remained for almost two decades. Sega had proven they were able to keep up with the industry as they shifted to discrete logic games in the 1970s, releasing titles such as 1976's Fonz and Heavyweight Champ all the way up to 1979's Monaco GP. And with the help of San Diego-based Gremlin Industries, Sega entered the microprocessor age with seminal titles that would help define the golden age of arcades. By the dawn of the 80s, Namco's Pac-Man was spreading fever and Nintendo's Donkey Kong introduced a future icon. Sega was also doing their part, delivering a steady stream of quality titles to the local game rooms that innovated as much as they entertained. 1981's Turbo ushered in scaling sprites and the now common third-person racing perspective. 1982's Subrock 3D utilized, as the name implies, stereoscopic 3D. And joystick jockeys were pleasantly befuddled by 1982's Zaxxon and its unique isometric perspective. Like many of the arcade giants at the time, Sega licensed many of their best games to Coleco and later the Atari for home conversions. Sega would later publish a handful of its titles directly as a third party, which is a tasty bowl of foreshadowing right there. Sega, starting to see the slow decline of the arcade, decided the home market would prove much more lucrative. And as fate would have it, Sega would release their first console in Japan, the SG-1000, the same day Nintendo released their Famicom, 
July 15, 1983, and with that, a two decade long rivalry would begin. The SG-1000 never made its way to the States and it's just as well. The console was produced on the cheap with off-the-shelf parts. It was graphically similar to the ColecoVision and for good reason. They share many of the same chips. Meanwhile, Nintendo's Famicom was a more powerful machine with its games representing a step forward in both presentation and complexity. Despite some stumbles in the beginning, Nintendo's family computer easily bested Sega. Not that Sega didn't try throwing more hardware at this problem. The SC3000 was released alongside the SG1000, internally similar except marketed as an inexpensive home computer. Sega! In 1984, the SG1000 II, a name which is not at all confusing, was released as a revision. The most noteworthy change saw the hardwired joysticks replaced by now standard removable control pads. Unfortunately, this upgrade did nothing to change their position as distant second behind Nintendo. A successor to the SG-1000 was released in 1985, entitled the Mark III. The upgrade offered superior visuals and higher RAM while maintaining compatibility with the SG-1000 line of software. Sega! By this time, Nintendo had brought their Famicom over to North America. Sega, still enjoying brand recognition with arcade hits like Hang On and Space Harrier, would do the same. For the Western market, the Mark III was rechristened the Sega Master System. Sega challenges you with the ultimate video game, the Sega Master System. The Master System hit North American stores in September of 1986. And while Sega had a healthy stable of their own games to port over to the console, Nintendo's iron grip on their third parties was detrimental to the Master System's library. Even with superior graphical capabilities and compelling peripherals such as the Sega Scope 3D, the Master System did little to make a dent in Nintendo's market share. Sega had a very unique approach to box art for North American Master System games. While they came in these plastic clamshell cases we all know and love, the covers looked like clip art pasted to graph paper as if it was some aborted grade school art project. Outrun is just a picture of a car and a silhouette of a palm tree. Gangster Town looks like something someone doodled while having a boring phone conversation. Black Belt here is literally just a foot exploding. Don't even ask me what's happening on the cover of Pro Wrestling. Where is his head? And Sega card games are an oddity all of their own. It's a picture of the guy holding the actual card. If they had only matched the label to the box art, they could have achieved a very trippy Drasta effect. While paid little mind in the US and Japan, the Master System did well in Europe. Even more impressive is its continued popularity in Brazil. Sega entered the country's market early on and made a deal with local toy manufacturer Tech Toy. Brazil has very strict import taxes that ensures local companies are favored. Through their partnership with Tech Toy, Sega had an inside company manufacturing hardware which allowed them to get their products on shelves for less money. And though they do have modern consoles, many are prohibitively expensive. Tech Toy continued releasing new titles for the system long after Sega discontinued their support, many of them quite impressive for an 8-bit machine. Take a look at this 1997 port of Street Fighter 2. You win! Fortunately, European respect and Brazilian success is only a nice consolation. A mere footnote in their quest for world domination of video games. Sega needed a new plan, not only to chip away at Nintendo's market share, but also to stay on top of a new competitor, NEC. They had just released their PC Engine console in Japan in 1987, advertising it as the first 16-bit console. Sega turned to their biggest strength, the arcade. The new console would be a scaled-down version of their System 16 hardware that powered popular arcade classics like Shinobi and Golden Axe. The new 16-bit console, the Sega Mega Drive, was released in Japan in October of 1988. The timing was nothing short of horrible, as it coincided with the highly anticipated Famicom release of Super Mario Bros. 3. While they did okay moving 400,000 units, it was nowhere near enough to break out of third place, falling behind both Nintendo and NEC. Sega of America CEO Michael Katz knew some aggressive marketing was needed for the North American release if they hoped to overcome Nintendo's monopolies on both third parties and retailers. Sega played on the system's arcade routes while gathering celebrity endorsements from the likes of Joe Montana, Pat Riley, Arnold Palmer, Tommy Lasorda, and even Michael Jackson. 
The Sega Mega Drive was rechristened the Sega Genesis for North America, allegedly over a trademark dispute. Or maybe they just had a thing for progressive pop. Live from your grave. In August of 1989, the Genesis hit stores, packaged with Altered Beast, a game that was merely... okay. Sega had an early ally in the form of a small company from Redwood City, California that used to sell software and album covers and talked up their designers as if they were rock stars. Sega needed a football game as their own offering was falling behind schedule. Electronic Arts had been looking to port their popular PC game, John Madden Football, to the home consoles. However, they were not in a position to pay Sega's royalties. Without a dev kit, engineers at Electronic Arts successfully reverse engineered the console. Free to make as many games as they wanted without paying any royalties, they instead struck a deal with Sega. Electronic Arts would be recognized as an official third party, while given a favorable deal on royalty payments. Also, EA was allowed to manufacture their own cartridges. And that's why they stick out awkwardly on your shelf like a sore thumb with a weird, useless yellow tab affixed to it. With Electronic Arts' official support, the Genesis would have a solid selection of quality sports titles that help sell consoles to armchair jockeys. 16-bit arcade graphics. While Sega was gaining some ground with their attack ads aimed squarely at Nintendo, they needed their own mascot that could take Mario head on. The video game version of Manimal was hardly a system seller, and nobody was carrying Alex Kidd lunchboxes to school. As the 90s was a decade in which everything was extreme, the new character would be given, pardon the expression, attitude. Sega went back and forth with different animals, an armadillo, a rabbit, even Teddy Roosevelt. No, really, he ended up becoming the basis for the antagonist. Eventually, they settled on a hedgehog. A little blue paint to match Sega's logo, a desire to run fast, and a modicum of impatience. And there you have Sonic the Hedgehog. He would become Sega's flagship franchise, with the first game premiering June 23rd, 1991. Nintendo entered the 16-bit realm in 1990 with the Japanese release of the Super Famicom, which was an immediate success. The console would be heading to the American market the following year as the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Sega knew it had to make some bold decisions in order to stay alive. Katz, failing to meet the expectations of his Japanese superiors, was replaced by Tom Kalinske. Kalinske decided that they had to drop the price of the Genesis to $149, which was $50 less than the Super Nintendo's launch price. He also decided that they needed to make their hottest new game, Sonic the Hedgehog, a pack-in title. The gambit paid off. Sonic's speed and rebelliousness resonated well with gamers, and Genesis consoles flew off shelves. The Super Nintendo, with a limited launch library and two years behind, finally had some real competition, and thus began the golden age of console gaming, the 16-bit wars. For the better part of a generation, schoolyards were having friendly, and perhaps not so friendly, debates over whose gaming allegiance was clearly superior. The Super Nintendo sported sexier graphics and better sound, but there was more street cred with Sega's machine. This was especially evident with the home ports of Mortal Kombat. While both console versions were competent, Sega's version had all the gratuitous blood and fatalities everyone expected so long as you inputted an easy-to-remember code. The Genesis port outsold the SNES port at a ratio of 4 to 1. Nintendo's always had this stigma of being a toy for ankle biters. The over-the-top censorship only helped to corroborate this claim. Indeed, Sega won fans of those who didn't want to be thought of as children. For the first time since they entered the hardware market, Sega could consider themselves winners. The Super Nintendo did eventually outsell the Genesis, but by a much smaller margin. Sega had succeeded in severely cutting into Nintendo's market share. However, Sega's 16-bit victories didn't translate into long-term success. The 1993 Sega CD add-on was definitely ambitious, but at $300, adoption of this hardware was slow. This is partially because CD-ROM technology was still new, and problems inherent with the format, like long load times, had not yet been ironed out. But the real problem was that so much of its library consisted of cheesy, poor-quality full-motion video that was light on actual gameplay. 
House rules, you've got to control the table to pick the music. And we're playing till somebody out there makes the ultimate in excess video. In November of 1994, Sega introduced the 32X. At $159, the add-on was designed as a relatively inexpensive entry point to 32-bit gaming. Possibly a decent idea were it available earlier, it was instead released way too close to a new generation of consoles on the horizon. This included not only new hardware from Nintendo and newcomer Sony, but also Sega themselves. When the 32X hit stores, the Saturn was already available in Japan with a US release imminent. Developers shot away from the 32X fearing that it would be essentially pointless. And they were right. Without any intercompatibility with the Saturn, it was little more than a complicated bandage for an aging console. The 32X was discontinued by 1996. Sega's handheld market didn't fare much better. AA batteries everywhere shrieked in horror when Sega launched the Color Game Gear handheld in 1990 in Japan and 1991 in North America. It had a decent selection of 8-bit games and was even able to play Master System cartridges with an adapter, but it was never able to surpass the Game Boy, whose hardware was a bit kinder to the Duracells and had better support from Nintendo. In 1995, Sega released the Nomad, essentially a portable Genesis. Once again, poor battery life and lack of support from Sega led to its early demise. For the kids, Sega released the Pico in 1993 in Japan and 1994 in the US. The system used interactive books featuring plenty of licensed characters from the likes of Disney, Richard Scarry, and of course, Sega themselves. If you've been paying attention, you see the problem here. At one point, Sega was supporting several pieces of hardware across several territories. The Genesis, the Nomad, the Sega CD, the 32X, the Pico, the Game Gear, the Master System, and the Saturn. With only so many resources to go around, Sega's unchecked hardware addiction meant that support suffered for many of their products. This left some consumers wary of investing further in Sega. While the 1994 Japanese launch of the Saturn was successful, the US release would be quite the opposite. The system, packaged with Virtua Fighter and priced at $399, was all set to hit stores on September 2nd, 1995, groan-inducingly dubbed Saturn Day. However, at 1995's Electronic Entertainment Expo, or E3, Tom Kalinske announced that the Saturn was available, right then and there, at four select retailers. This angered not only other retailers who weren't one of those four, especially KB Toys who protested by dropping their Sega line entirely, but also many programmers who found they had even less time to complete software. Sega also had the misfortune of making that announcement ahead of Steve Race, president of Sony Computer Entertainment America. Because all Steve had to do was walk out and say, $2.99. Sega was not only competing against their old rival Nintendo, but now also Sony, whose PlayStation was delivering on both price and content. While Sega's Saturn had some highly regarded titles, the console lacked a dedicated Sonic game. Sonic was the ambassador for the company, and his absence, save for a spin-off racing game and some 16-bit re-releases, not only gave fewer reasons for anyone to splurge on the console, but can also be seen as a lack of confidence on Sega's part. In 1998, owing to Saturn's poor performance, Japan's fiscal recession, and an overall decline in the industry, Sega posted a net loss of almost $328 million. They also announced that after only three years, the Saturn would be discontinued in North America in favor of their next venture, the Dreamcast. I know there's so much more about Sega that we didn't even touch upon. For example, I didn't even bring up Sega Visions, their answer to Nintendo Power. But in the next episode, we'll discuss Sega's last console more in depth and also cover, spoiler alert, their exit from the hardware market and the aftermath. In the meantime, this is Dave for TV Games. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. See you next time. Check this out. Yo, Yo. Master System cost him 80 pounds. One white color and free channel sound. Yeah, they got more games than Fish of the Thoughts. Like Operation Warfare and Psycho Fox. HQ, World Soccer, Baseball, Wonderboy 2 The list of games goes on and on and on Sega bosses up 100 strong Sega 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 Yeah man, stand out, tell me more Yeah, okay As well as a console, you get an idea
Dave. We got your golden axe.